Welcome to Heating Up, an open discussion of hot topics from the world of sports. With your hosts, Russell Jones and Elijah Wilson, Heating Up is a production of the Communication Department at Austin P. State University. Produced in the studios of WAPX-FM, opinions expressed are those of its hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the comm department, the station, or APSU. You're Heating Up on Clarksville's 91.9 FM. Hello, everyone, and welcome into Heating Up. I'm Russell Jones, and joined alongside me is always fantastic Elijah Wilson as we're set to recap week six of college football as it was another exciting weekend. We'll start in Martin, Tennessee, as Dawson P. Governors traveled to play UT Martin in an OVC matchup. The Governors fell to Martin 45-31, to but Kendall Morris did have 103 yards and one TD in rushing. Tamarius Mitchell was 17 for 23, 227 yards and two TDs. The Governor's rally to score 21 points in the fourth quarter, but it just wasn't enough. Yeah, and you can add Kyron Moore to that great stat line. He had uh, 96 yards receiving. It's his career high. Gunnar Shalato, the number two leading tackler in the NCAA, and the Govs trailed 31-7 at halftime. Couldn't overcome that deficit. Coach Will Hill, he said after the game that he was proud of his Govs for competing and fighting in the second half, but that competing and fighting, just not enough as the Govs fell in Martin. And then we're going to go to a big time matchup as the Texas A&M Aggies hosted the Tennessee Volunteers as that one went into overtime, but the Aggies come out victorious 45-38 to in that game. Yeah, and that was a fantastic game, fantastic game to be at. I was there with CBS and just an unbelievable game. Unbelievable atmosphere at Kyle Field, one of the best in the nation, 106,000 on hand for that game. And that game just proved to be unbelievable. Tennessee turnovers did them in. They had seven turnovers in the game. Josh Dobbs wasn't great about holding on to the football. Alvin Kamara and John Kelly each had a fumble. Josh Dobbs fumbled a couple times through a couple picks, one of those in overtime to seal the game uh, to Armani Watts. But a very uh, well-fought game for both Travion Williams, 217 yards on the ground for Texas A&M, first freshman to do that at Texas A&M. But my heating up player of the week is gonna be Alvin Kamara. He had 288 all-purpose yards receiving and rushing on the day. Played an unbelievable game in the absence of Jalen Hurd. Uh, Tennessee had their halfback screen working for him all day as John Chavis sent the cavalry with a blitz, every, oh, seemed like every play, and Alvin Kamara just diced up that defense, looked very good. And so if you're Mike DeBoard, the offense coordinator, and Butch Jones, I don't know how you don't give him Kamara the ball more as Alabama rolls into town this week. Definitely Tennessee fans are going to be calling for Kamara uh, a lot this week against Alabama, as Alabama will come in in Knoxville, and that's going to be a huge game. But is it time to give the range of the ball carries to Alvin Kamara over Jalen Hurd? Kamara was very versatile. Uh, Kamara went inside the tackles. He went off tackle. And the problem therein lied with Alvin Kamara is when they tried to run around Miles Garrett and Deshaun Hall. Texas A&M had so much speed that they weren't able to run outside the tackles too often. But uh, Kamara looked very good for Tennessee, and so I don't understand how you wouldn't be able to give him a lot of carries this week with a very fast, talented, and athletic Alabama defense. And then now we're going to go to the Pac-12 as there was a huge surprising score as I was throwing through my, scrolling through my CBS Sports Score app uh, Saturday night. I seen this score. Washington defeats Oregon 70-21, to and that was in Eugene as the Oregon Ducks program has fallen quite a bit from the past few years. We're used to seeing Chip Kelly teams blow out teams in Eugene, but Washington was impressive. Jake Browning threw for 306 yards, six touchdowns, zero mistakes. Miles Gaskin, the running back for the Washington Huskies, was 197 yards on the ground and one TD. So remember those two names because I believe the Washington Huskies are going to be a playoff team when it's all said and done. Yeah, the Washington Huskies are here and they are for real. Like Russell said, zero turnovers on the day. And that's a Chris Peterson team that's very disciplined. When you think about Chris Peterson, you think Boise State. Boise State, to get their name heard back in the day, they had to be very, very disciplined with the football. And that's exactly what he has brought 
to Washington. And Jake Browning, unbelievable play, six touchdowns. He had an unbelievable game um, in, yeah, sophomore quarterback. And so he went 22 of 28. Unbelievable day for Washington Huskies. And looks like they are for real in the Pac-12. And they are really the only hope the Pac-12 has of reaching the college football playoff this year. Alabama looked impressive again as we go back to the SEC, defeating Arkansas 49-30. to They just seem like a team that's destined, again, for another playoff run. Yeah, and I thought Arkansas was going to get a little bit more fight than they did. The score was even a little bit closer than the game actually was. Austin Allen had three interceptions, all three to Minka Fitzpatrick, who played an unbelievable game. Tim Williams and Mika Fitzpatrick both had defensive touchdowns, and that kind of did Arkansas in were the turnovers. And Arkansas gets beat with Alabama coming to town in Fayetteville. But it looks like Jalen Hurts and Big Saban are uh, back in the national contention. But what stood out to me the most is how Nick Saban has evolved his team. Mm -hmm. He used to be a ground and pound team. Uh, with Derrick Henry and Mark Ingram and Trent Richardson, Eddie Lacy, all those guys. But he brought in Lane Kiffin, evolved his offense a little bit, something that Les Miles wasn't willing to do, keeping Cam Cameron as his offensive coordinator. That eventually did Les Miles in. But Nick Saban has evolved, moved to a little bit more of a pro-style offense, uh, maybe a little spread here and there, a pistol formation here and there. But Nick Saban has been able to evolve his office, and that's why Alabama has flourished for so long. But Alabama still has a star running back, and that's in Damian Harris, who had 13 carries, 122 yards. Along with him and Bo Scarborough, that offense still has some guys in the tailback position that can be stars. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't see Texas A&M or, Alabama, or, Texas A &M or Tennessee um, beating Alabama in the next few weeks, but we'll talk about that in the next segment. Well, we're going to take a break, and we'll be previewing college football week seven as we come back. Keep watching Govs TV and listening to Clarksville 91.9. If you or someone you know is interested in attending Austin P, make sure to sign up for AP Day. AP Day provides an opportunity to preview the university, and it's coming up Saturday, October 29th. Tour the campus, meet with academic departments and campus organizations. There's also sessions on admissions, financial aid, and housing. For more, go to APSU.edu forward slash AP Day or call 1-800-844-APSU. A campus and community reminder from 91.9 FM. Welcome back to What's That Gas? I'm your host, Donnie, and today we're going to ask our contestants, what is carbon monoxide? Carbon monoxide, or CO, is an odorless, colorless gas that can kill you. Where is CO found? CO is found in fumes produced anytime you burn fuel in cars, small engines, stoves, fireplaces, and other heating units. What are the symptoms of CO poisoning? The most common symptoms of CO poisoning are headache, dizziness, upset stomach, vomiting, and confusion. If you breathe in a lot of CO, it can make you pass out or kill you. Contestant 2! Name as many carbon monoxide poisoning prevention methods as you can in 15 seconds. Install a battery-operated battery backup CO detector in your home. Place your detector where it will wake you up outside your bedroom. And, oh man, God, replace your CO detector every five years. The 10th Annual Movies in the Park series continues every other Saturday through the beginning of October. The outdoor showings are taking place at McGregor Park until July 9th and will move to Liberty Park beginning July 23rd. The movies are free and begin at dusk with themed activities starting an hour before. For more information about the Movies in the Park series, check www.cityofclarksville.com slash events or call 645-7476. A community reminder from 91.9 FM. Welcome back into Heating Up. I'm Russell Jones, and joined alongside me is Elijah Wilson as we're set to preview college football week seven as we're more than halfway there from the college football playoff and those conference championship games before that. And let's preview a big game in Fayetteville, Arkansas, as it, in terms of SEC, as Ole Miss will travel to Fayetteville and play Arkansas. Arkansas, a seven-and-a-half point dog in that game. Yeah, and I think that might be a little low. I see Ole Miss handily taking this game with Chad Kelly. Um, Arkansas, I don't see being able to contain Ole Miss. And so this game should go Ole Miss's way, 
this has a lot of implications for the SEC West. Arkansas already has two losses in the SEC West, so they're all but out of it. Ole Miss only has one loss in the SEC West to Alabama, and so if they can win out, maybe get a few things to go their way, then I think maybe Ole Miss could win the SEC West still potentially, but I, I see Ole Miss's high potent offense being able to take care of a slow, slower uh, Brett Bielema Arkansas team. Is Chad Kelly the best quarterback in the SEC? No doubt. Chad Kelly's the best quarterback in the SEC. Um, maybe one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. We would probably be talking about him a lot more if Lamar Jackson hadn't sprung onto the scene this year, him and Deshaun Watson probably battling it out. Chad Kelly is very versatile. When you see him play, he doesn't look very fast, but he's very versatile. He can throw the ball a mile, and he's got very big, talented, tall receivers who can go up and get the ball and so he sometimes can just lob it up to him and let him go get it. He's definitely been impressive so far this year. We'll keep it in the SEC as the Alabama Crimson Tide, the number one team in the land, travels in Knoxville to face off the Tennessee Volunteers who stayed at number nine in the AP poll. They are a 13 point dog in this one. I feel like that line's about right, uh, but what does Tennessee have to do this week to slow down that Crimson Tide offense and put some points on the board. Tennessee's got to start faster. Tennessee has started slow the past couple weeks. They went down 21 to Florida, 14 or 21 to Georgia, and uh, they went down 14 to Texas A&M. And so they're going to have to start faster and so alleviate turnovers in the first half, which they haven't done recently. But they're going to have to slow down the Alabama run game, which may be hard because Tennessee is very banged up. They announced the other day that Danny O'Brien will uh, has been kicked off the team, which was unrelated to his injury. And so um, that that defense got really banged up at Texas A&M. And so that'll be interesting to see if they're able to slow down Jalen Hurts running the ball, but also Damian Harris running the ball. When you look at it on paper, uh, Alabama is going to be a heavy favorite in this game. When, when you compare the two quarterbacks and Jalen Hurts and Joshua Dobbs, in my opinion, you give the edge to Jalen Hurts. When you compare the running backs, Damian Harris, Bo Scarborough, Alvin Kamara, and uh, Jalen Hurd, that might be a little closer battle and about even, but Damian Harris and Bo Scarborough have both been very impressive. So there's really not an advantage Tennessee holds at all going into this game, and that usually bodes for a big loss. Yeah, and I'm sure that Lane Kiffin watched Texas A&M film last week to see Texas A&M receivers beating uh, Tennessee DBs deep all weekend. And so you've got two guys, Ardarius Stewart and Calvin Ridley, that are going to have monster games against Tennessee. These two guys are speed demons, and they're going to torch Tennessee this weekend uh, with a young and hurt defensive secondary with Todd Kelly trying to, trying to man that defense by himself, it seems like. And when we talk about a game where a team's hold a statistical advantage in every aspect, that's why I'm going to give you my lock of the week right here as we go to the Big Ten as Ohio State travels to Madison, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, a 10-point dog in this one, and I think that's too little. I see Ohio State with JT Barrett and Mike Weber just absolutely destroying this Wisconsin team. Uh, Weber has 566 yards and four TDs. JT Barrett's still impressive. And Ohio State with Urban Meyer has just been that team this year that nobody's really talking about, but have dominated just about every game they've played. And they look like another team that could win a national title with Urban Meyer, and they're just so impressive. Now, Wisconsin coming off a of bye week, their last game was a seven point loss to a very, very impressive Michigan team but I just don't see this one bolding well for Wisconsin as Tennessee doesn't hold an advantage against Alabama in any way, nor does Wisconsin in any way against Ohio State. Yeah, and you talked about uh, Urban Meyer and his team flying under the radar. I think that's exactly how he wants it. He wants his team to fly under the radar a little bit and not get a ton of attention like this Bama team is or any other team for that matter. But you see Wisconsin matching up against this Ohio State team, and you see Wisconsin playing Michigan really tough a few weekends ago. But I don't see Ohio State as a team nearly similar to Michigan. Uh, Ohio State has a very good offense with a very versatile quarterback in JT Barrett. And so I see Ohio State putting up a lot of points and Wisconsin not being able to really counter that and put up many points at all. Good, good take on that. I see that as well, Wisconsin not being able to just 
move the football and put points, put points on the board is going to be their downfall in this one. We're going to take another break. We're going to come back and recap NFL Week 5 and give you a preview of NFL Week 6. Stay tuned to Govs TV and keep listening to Clarksville 91.9. If you're a registered voter in Montgomery County and you would like to cast an early ballot for the November 8th State General and City of Clarksville election, you have from October 19th until the close of business November 3rd. Early voting is at the Montgomery County Election Commission on Pageant Lane from 8 until 6 weekdays and 8 until 4 Saturdays. You'll need a state or federal photo ID in order to cast your ballot. For more information, call 648-5707. A community reminder from 91.9 FM. Help support Austin P. State University students who don't have enough to eat. Donate to the Save Our Students Food Pantry. Soup, pasta, canned meat, canned beans, peanut butter, and fruit are welcome. You can drop off your donations at the pantry on Home Avenue. It's open Tuesdays through Fridays, 8.30 to 4. For more information, call 221-6120. That's 221-6120. A campus reminder from Clarksville's 91.9 FM. Our men and women in uniform make sacrifices for our country every day, and so many of them are dealing with physical and emotional scars as a result of their service. You can help them through your support of the Wounded Warrior Project. The Wounded Warrior Project has 18 unique direct programs to help our wounded warriors, their families, and caregivers. To find out more, go to WoundedWarriorProject.com. A campus and community reminder from Clarksville's 91.9 FM. Want to keep up with all the cool things we do here at 91.9 FM? Check out our new Facebook page and like us. It's easy, 91.9 FM. Not too hard to remember, right? We post news about what we're working on here at the radio station, what's going on around the Austin Peay campus, and important events in Clarksville, Montgomery County, and Fort Campbell. You can send us messages too. A campus and community reminder from the voice of Austin Peay, Clarksville's 91.9 FM. Welcome back into Heating Up. I'm Russell Jones, and alongside me is Elijah Wilson as we're set to recap NFL Week 5. And the Tennessee Titans were impressive this week as they traveled down to Miami and dominated in this one. The score doesn't quite uh, tell the story as they win 30-17. to They did give up a punt return for a touchdown, so another special teams error. But the Titans dominated this game in every aspect. Mariota comes this week with a chip on his shoulder and plays very impressive, passing for two touchdowns and rushing for another. DeMarco Murray had 127 yards on the ground, 235 yards of total rushing for the Tennessee Titans. The defense racks up six sacks, impressive across the board. Yeah, and if you take away the Dolphins' big plays from this past weekend, the Dolphins are very close to getting shut out. Um, Jarvis Landry didn't have a great game. Kenny Stills didn't have a great game. If it wasn't for a punt return and a couple other big plays, you're looking at a game that's close to the Titans shutting out the Dolphins. And so Titans fans, there you go. Can we stop talking about Marcus Mariota not being the future of the Titans because he is here, he's here to stay. Yes, the Dolphins aren't the best team in the NFL, but a win is a win is a win is a win. I've been very hard on Terry Robisky this year, and I'm going to kind of ease off on it because I feel like this Titans offense is starting a little get, to get more comfortable and learn that balance of handing the football off to DeMarco Murray and Derrick Henry, two guys who you need the ball to be in their hands for you to win, and also getting Marcus Mariota in a rhythm. And I think that starts with getting Mariota um, to run early and find those gaps like he did against Miami. I think he had a 23-yard run and a scramble in the next to last drive before halftime that led to a touchdown pass to Delaney Walker where he was perfect on that drive. And then the touchdown run, it, when Marcus Mariota gets to moving his feet, in turn it gets him more comfortable. He's very similar to Steve McNair for those of you who remember. It was like that for McNair. Once McNair would take off for that early run, it would almost ease him into the game. Um, and I think it's important for Marcus Mariota to find Delaney Walker more early, get him in a rhythm. And I think that's what we did against Miami, and I think we'll see that the rest of the year. Yeah, and it helped that Marcus Mariota had all his weapons back. He had Delaney Walker out for a while, Kendall Wright out for a while, uh, and so a couple guys that were hurt early. And so 
um, getting comfortable with them again. But there's also this gray area, I feel like, with the Titans where Terry Robisky can't run Marcus Mariota too often because right. you have to save his legs, you have to keep him healthy, and you can't let him take any shots, you know. And so there's a gray area in that where that lies. And so Marcus Mariota did a great job this weekend of controlling that offense and spreading, spreading it around to all of his teammates. Well, another thing that was very impressive was the Titans defense. Derek Morgan took advantage of a banged up Miami Dolphins offensive line. Um, Laramie Tunsil was out. They had a very new start in left tackle. Uh, Derek Morgan racked up two sacks along with Brian Arakpo and Jarrell Casey. This defense is here to stay as one of the top defenses in NFL. Definitely top 15, one of the upper echelon as it's ran by Dick LeBeau. Jason McCourty keeps on making plays, and Damian Stafford, in replacement of Denora Searcy, has stepped up and pretty much solidified himself as a starting safety in that role next to Rashad Johnson with Kevin Byard coming in and giving him spots. But Parrish Cox has probably been the weak spot of that defense, but he had another great game. And that Titans defense is looking to get actually better and better as the weeks go on. Yeah, and the Titans defense looked incredible this past weekend. And we talk about old school versus new school. And this Titans team looks like an old school team. You've got a great offensive line now behind Taylor Lewan and Jack Conklin, two of the highest rated tackles in the game right now. And you've got a stout defense racked up six sacks this past week. But what I was most impressed with was the Titans secondary. Evidently, Jason McCourty gave a pretty spirited pep talk before the game and uh, told the Titans secondary that they need to step up and make plays. And the thing you see in the NFL is secondary has to play well. You don't see people say that uh, you don't have spots where the secondary is weak and things like that. But secondary has looked good. You see that a lot of quarterbacks are making good throws, receivers making good plays but you have to have a secondary to step up and make better plays. And that's exactly what they did. And we didn't expect Parrish Cox to be the weak point coming into the season, but he has he played really well. McCourty with a pick this weekend. And so that Titans defense looked really, really good. All they have to do is stay healthy and they should be in for a very good couple weeks. If the front seven of the Tennessee Titans can keep this play up, it's only going to make uh, Jason McCourty and Parrish Cox and Rashad Johnson and Damian Stafford's job easier. And Avery Williamson has been the anchor of that defense right in the middle as he continues his spectacular play alongside Wesley Woodyard and Morgan and Arakpo anchoring down the edges. They have been outstanding, and they can keep that up going into an easy part of the schedule. But we'll get into that more. I want to touch on the man is back, Tom Brady, comes back from New England as they blow out the Browns 33-13. to Brady was 28 for 40 for 406 yards and three TDs. The general is back in his seat. Yeah, and when I saw that that was a 10-point line, I laughed at it. I knew that the Pats were going to blow him out. People said Brady was going to be rusty. There's no such thing with Tom Brady. He gave it to Gronk. Gronk had 109 yards, who looks to be very healthy now, uh, recovering from that hamstring injury. But if there was any doubt if Tom Brady was back, He's back and he's here to stay. Well, he also found Martellus Bennett two times. I had him on my fantasy lineup, so that was a good pickup for me. But And I'd hate to bring this guy's name up, but before all the trouble happened with Aaron Hernandez, Brady and Belichick had this with Hernandez and Gronk, and it seems like they have it again with Bennett and Gronk. And what I mean what they have is, is two tight ends that can prevent uh, present mismatch problems when they line up against linebackers and even corners and safeties, Bennett and Gronk, two big guys that Brady can find. And when you add Danny Amendola and Chris Hogan into the mix, Brady has tons of weapons again to throw the ball to. And then LeGarrette Blunt continues his great play with him handing it off. This New England offense is scary. Yeah, and don't forget about Julian Edelman. You've got two guys that create mismatches all over the field with Bennett and Gronk. Uh, and the problem therein lies when safety tries to come up and they try to play man on uh, Gronk or Martellus Bennett. Those guys just out-muscle them, but if you put linebackers on them, they're too skilled, they have too good of ball skills, or too fast for those linebackers to cover them. And so those guys just have a field day now because once you key in on Martellus Bennett, you, you go to Gronk. Once you key in on Gronk, you go to Bennett. If you put all of your effort on both of those guys, you've got Edelman, Amendola, Chris Hogan, easy day for Tom Brady. Oh, for sure. 
And now we're going to move to the Minnesota Vikings as they defeat the Texans 31 to 13. And the Vikings, I feel like, have now solidified themselves as the favorite to win the NFC. Sam Bradford went 22 for 30, 271 yards and two TDs. And that Vikings defense is the best in the NFL, in my opinion. Edging out Denver's defense barely, but the Atlanta Falcons took care of that Denver defense and showed they not they're human. They're not perfect. Yeah, and I'm sure the Minnesota defense is human as well. But man, they look impressive. Yeah, and I told everyone that they needed to to pump the brakes a little bit when Teddy Bridgewater went out. Teddy Bridgewater isn't that integral part of their offense, and they get they go and get Sam Bradford, trade a first round pick for him, keep their hopes alive, and it looks like they're in the driver's seat in that NFC North with the Packers and the Bears. Um, Packers don't look as strong this year. I wasn't super impressed with them this uh, past uh, Sunday night when they faced off against the Giants. For sure. That Aaron Rodgers offense does not look to be too potent. Um, Jordy Nelson and Randall Cobb are still in that receiving core, but he looks like he's missing that speedy guy. They did beat the Giants, though, but the Giants are struggling as well offensively as Eli Manning and Odell Beckham Jr. are struggling to find a rhythm. But we're going to move on to week six of the NFL, and I just want to let people know how important this game against Cleveland is this week at home. For first off, the Titans hadn't won a home game outside of beating the Jacksonville Jaguars in two years. They hadn't won back-to-back -back games since 2013 when Mike Malarkey, uh, Mike Malarkey led team, not Mike Malarkey, Mike Munchak, excuse me folks, a Mike Munchak led team won their last two games. and. The Titans, it's time for them to start breaking a lot of streaks. This is how important this game is. They have the Browns at home, then the Colts, then the Jacks, then they travel to San Diego, and then Packers, Colts, Bears, Broncos, Chiefs, Jags, and Texans. There's really only two or three teams that scare me on that schedule. So the Titans are in a very good position now if they can take care of the games they need to take care of, and that's beating Cleveland, who we don't know. I guess it'll be Cody Kessler at quarterback, as we've seen Charlie Whitehurst and even Terrell Pryor last week against the Patriots, a Cleveland team that doesn't have a lot of talent and is struggling to keep their head above water. They hadn't won a game this week. The Titans open up as a seven-point favorite. I love that line. I think they blow it out of the water and win this game by three touchdowns. Yeah, I think that the Titans' defense is licking their chops when they see Cody Kessler in the backfield. I didn't see Cody Kessler as a great college quarterback, and then you put him in the pros. I don't see him doing any better in the pros. I see the Titans winning this game big, but you could uh, be a, bit, a little bit weary of a letdown coming this week after a big win on the road against the Dolphins. You play the Browns, who aren't very good. Terrell Pryor, like you said, is probably the, the light in that, uh, that Cleveland offense, but I love this game for the Titans. I love it for the matchup. I love it for the Titans home fans to hopefully finally see a win in Nissan Stadium. And so I, I love this game for the Titans. DeMarco Murray and Derrick Henry should have a field day against that Cleveland defense. Listening to Mike Malarkey last night discuss this game, the Titans have lost to the Browns the last two years. And if you remember last year's game, it was Johnny Manziel's big hoorah as he came out and scorched the Titans. And Mike Malarkey said last night, we're not focused on that. We're focused on the future. These are two new teams. We're a new team. There's a lot of new faces and players on this Titans team. And I like that message. This is a new team. We're going to start breaking streaks and breaking the norms of having a letdown game because this is a new old school team. And I feel like if they can keep it simple and hand the ball off to DeMarco Murray, keep Derrick Henry, keep this offense simple for Marcus Mariota for the easy throws, which I think they can do against Cleveland, I feel like they win this game easily. Some other games to keep in note, the Eagles will face off against the Redskins. They're coming off their first loss of the year. Winstow was impressive as he threw for two touchdowns, but the Redskins coming off a road win in Baltimore more. Um, they're at home in this one. They're a two and a half point dog and um, I like the Redskins in that one. Yeah, I like the Redskins as well. Eagles, I don't see them winning this one either. Wins through his first pick. I see this as a game that the Redskins can win. I like the Jags to cover against the Bears and the Bills to cover against the 49ers as well this week. That's all the time we have for. I'm Russell Jones. This is Elijah Wilson. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching Govs TV and listening to Clarksville 91.9.
You've been listening to Heating Up, a weekly discussion of hot topics in the world of sports. Heating Up is a copyrighted production of the Communication Department at Austin P. State University and produced in the studios of WAPX-FM. Opinions expressed on Heating Up are those of its hosts and guests and not necessarily those of the comm department, the station, or APSU. Join us next week for another edition of Heating Up on Clarksville's 91.9 FM.